A scandal at the World Series of Poker involving the winner of the main event doesn't get much juicier than this. While you're a TV producer, Jamie, could you have scripted this any better? No, it was amazing. Because even though the world of professional poker has seen its fair share of drama and controversies over the years, few have captured the attention of the poker community quite like the Jamie Gold backing scandal. This scandal, which unfolded in 2006, not only cast a shadow on the poker world, but also brought into question the ethics and the integrity of the game. I'll give you one chance to save yourself. Boy, he looks agonized. I don't like you anymore. So let's get into it. But before we do, please make sure to subscribe to Poker Boom and hit the bell so you never miss a new episode. And please leave us a comment. We're always in there and we would love to interact with you. Jamie Gold, born Jamie Usher, was born on August 25th, 1969 in Kansas City, Missouri. Despite his Midwestern roots, Gold found his true calling in Las Vegas in the high stakes world of poker. I'm not calling 20,000 with nothing. Well, of course you're not. Me neither, I'm not raising with nothing, right? I know. His journey into professional poker was a unique one. Unlike many other professional poker players who honed their skills through years of grinding in local card rooms, Gold's entry into the poker scene was marked by a combination of natural talent and strategic connections. His early exposure to the game came from his grandfather, who was a successful gambler and a champion gin rummy player. When Jamie was a kid, he learned to count watching his grandfather play gin rummy. He'd go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. At only 16 years old, Gold began his career in the entertainment business as an intern at the J. Michael Bloom and Associates Talent Agency. He became a talent agent before he was 21 years old, but soon moved to the management side and rep massive clients as big as Jimmy Fallon. His ability to negotiate and manage high pressure situations would later prove valuable in the world of poker. You know, I can't talk anymore. Well, it wouldn't be polite while you're eating. You call, you got a shot, you lose, it's pretty much over. Gold's poker journey took a significant turn when he collaborated with two former WSOP main event champions, Johnny Chan and Chris Moneymaker, for an upcoming television project. It was during this collaboration that Chan began to impart his wealth of poker knowledge to Gold, effectively mentoring him in the nuances of the game. And now Johnny Chan is mentoring our chip leader, Jamie Gold, who has 8-5 of diamonds. In 2005, Gold's poker journey reached a pivotal point, as he immersed himself in regular tournament play. Over the next 12 months, Gold's dominance at the poker table was showcased through seven more in-the-money finishes in tournaments. Tell me to look at this head now. <laughs> I could be slow playing a monster. Notably, Gold's proximity to Chris Ferguson, the champion of the 2000 WSOP main event, had a significant impact on his poker development. In interviews and conversations, Gold has often lauded Ferguson as one of the few professional players who endorsed and appreciated his unique poker style during the 2006 main event tournament, a tournament that Gold was obviously going to win. But as we all know now, Chris Ferguson might not be the best person to be in your corner, as evidenced by this other video we've done around him. Bluff Magazine conducted a thorough analysis of Gold's winning poker strategies. Their assessment was nothing short of glowing, noting that he continually compelled his fellow table mates to risk their entire chip stacks. I call him. I got a set of kings. You got ace jack, huh? Ace jack. Unbelievable. And now you you're watching the biggest pot in the history of high stakes uh, poker. When faced with a re raise, he exhibited an uncanny ability to figure out whether his opponents held unbeatable hands, leading him to fold, or whether they were attempting to bluff him, prompting him to make audacious all in moves. His performance at the 2006 World Series of Poker was frankly nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, I said it in our last telecast, Lon, it doesn't matter what two cards he plays, Jamie Gold always wins the hand. He hits the flop again, trips sixes for our chip leader. In the final hand of the tournament, he held a queen nine off suit and made a pair on the flop of queen eight five. He was heads up against Paul Wasco, who held pocket tens and didn't improve with an ace on the turn and a four on the river. Gold would go on to win a record prize of $12 million, one of the largest payouts in poker history. Jamie Gold has done it! But despite this initial euphoria surrounding his remarkable victory, the poker community soon found itself embroiled in controversy due to a backing arrangement that came to light after the WSOP main event. Should those who have a vested financial interest in what takes place here insist on a written, signed agreement? It all depends on who you ask. 
Now a backing arrangement in poker typically involves an investor or backer putting up the buy-in for a tournament on behalf of a player, with the understanding that they will receive a portion of the player's winnings in return. In Gold's case, it was revealed that he had agreed to a backing deal with Crispin Laser, who was a close friend and business associate. Laser staked Gold for the $10,000 buy-in at the main event, and they agreed to split the winnings evenly if Gold secured a cash prize. However, the nature of their arrangement raised eyebrows because Gold failed to disclose this backing deal during the main event. This non-disclosure not only violated the WSOP rules, but also cast doubt on the integrity of Gold's victory. The controversy deepened when Laser, who felt slighted by Gold's actions, filed a lawsuit against him. Laser argued that he was entitled to half of Gold's $12 million prize, leading to a protracted legal battle that played out in the public eye. The legal proceedings unveiled a complex web of allegations and counter-allegations. Gold argued that Laser's backing was conditional, while Laser contended that he had backed Gold in good faith. The case was eventually settled out of court, with Gold agreeing to pay Laser an undisclosed amount. Oh, it's so great. You know, the first moment we sat down, it was all over. It was a misunderstanding from the first place, so there should have never been one in the first place. So it was all really stupid. Nevertheless, the scandal left a lasting stain on Gold's reputation and on the poker world as a whole. Following the backing scandal, Jamie Gold's poker career experienced a significant downturn. And a second extension oh, looks like it has been oh. burned by gold. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my. Who turns the Jack's face <laughs> up and mucks him. His reputation took a hit, and many in the community questioned his ethics and his integrity. His tournament results also failed to live up to the standard set by his WSOP main event victory. He struggled to achieve the same level of success and was unable to secure another major tournament title. Since his main event victory in 2006, his greatest cash has come in the 26th 16 Los Angeles WSOP circuit main event, where he finished runner-up and claimed $139,820. In recent years, Jamie Gold has largely faded from the competitive poker circuit. Instead, he's turned his attention back to the world of entertainment and has been working on a variety of production deals. But the Jamie Gold scandal remains a significant chapter in the history of the game. It serves as a reminder of the importance of transparency, of ethics and of sportsmanship in the poker world. While Gold's remarkable victory in the 2006 WSOP main event will always be a part of poker lore, the controversy surrounding his backing arrangement have definitely put a permanent tinge of darkness across the entire experience. The poker community has evolved since the scandal, with increased awareness and scrutiny regarding backing agreements and a greater emphasis on fair play. And as for Jamie Gold, his legacy remains a complex one, a mix of extraordinary success and enduring controversy controversy. Prior to winning the main event, Gold joked that he would rather come second place so he wouldn't have to worry about the pressure of being famous. At that point, the thought of being infamous probably never even crossed his mind. The only thing I can do is play the best poker I can, be sharp, be focused, hopefully I get a little lucky, and maybe I can win. Scandals in the world of poker happen all the time. We've even covered a lot of them here on Poker Boom. But one of the biggest scandals of late involved a player named Mike Possel. And the scandal would take on such prominence that it even got a gate attached to the end of its name. This is the story of Possel-gate. A Henderson man, one of 25 players, accusing one of their own of cheating. 13 Action News reporter Austin Carter explains how they say he swindled them out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Little is known about Mike Possel's early years or really about him at all. However, it's safe to say he grew up far removed from the glitz and glamour of the high-stakes Las Vegas poker tables. His introduction to poker wasn't a dramatic affair. Rather, it was a gradual immersion into the game that would later define his life. His love for poker blossomed in local home games and small casino tournaments, where he honed his skills and developed a reputation as a formidable player. However, as the poker bug bit deeper, Postle wanted more and this desire would later take him one step too close to the edge. And right before I played, all the locals told me, it was like overwhelmingly, watch out for Postle, he's the best. The best, now accused of cheating, slammed with a $10 million civil lawsuit. In July of 2018, he embarked on an extraordinary run of success, securing winnings totaling approximately $250,000. His triumphs predominantly unfolded in the realm of low-stakes, no-limit Texas Hold'em games, 
specifically in the 1, 3, and 2, 5 categories, hosted at Stone's Gambling Hall in Citrus Heights near Sacramento, California. The epicenter of Postle's victorious spree was the live stream games, where his skills consistently shone. Just over a year into his prosperous journey during a Stone's Live live stream in September 2019, suspicions that had lingered for months were seemingly validated. Veronica Brill, the color commentator at Stone's Gambling Hall, who had previously voiced concerns, became increasingly convinced that Postle was engaged in cheating. The conviction solidified as she observed perplexing and unconventional games play during a critical moment. Apostle's winnings, according to the lawsuit, were not known to have been achieved by any other poker player, describing the chances of his winnings statistically unfathomable in the world of professional poker. In one notable hand during a recurring Stones Live livestream Hold'em game, where Apostle exhibited his recurrent unorthodox style, Brill expressed her disbelief. Despite holding a solid hand, Apostle opted to discard his cards rather than call a bet, leaving Brill to comment, it doesn't make sense. It's like he knows. It doesn't make sense. It's weird. A week later, Brill doubled down on her suspicions by releasing an 18-minute video as well as a series of tweets showcasing Postle's consistently peculiar hands, deviating from established professional poker norms. In each instance highlighted in Brill's video, Postle emerged victorious or saved money by discarding a powerful hand that conventionally should have been played, according to the principles of professional poker players' game theory and conventional wisdom. Currently at 370, Mike P checks because he feels like Brian is a, most likely to fire when he does, and so we're gonna get a check rate. Within the poker community, comprising players, announcers, bloggers, authors, and those overseeing card rooms and technical controls, a consensus emerged upon reviewing archive Stones Live livestream footage. Yeah, and Mike's instincts are just, Mike, yeah, Mike, Mike can see his opponent's cards tonight. right now. He, he just can see their cards. Many echoed Brill's apprehension, contending that Postle likely possessed real-time knowledge of his opponent's whole cards and the strength of their hands. Individuals associated with poker's game theory community, both well-known and lesser-known, asserted that the frequency with which Postle won hands or saved money through discarding in critical situations bordered on mathematical improbability, suggesting foul play. Between. I told Jamin right away, I said there's no in-between with me. I either run better than everyone or worse than everyone. There's no in-between. Throughout the period from July 2018 to September 2019, the alleged time frame of Postle's cheating, he consistently demonstrated an uncanny ability to bluff at opportune moments, accurately calling bluffs from opponents and strategically folding powerful hands. Archived video footage unveiled instances where Postle repeatedly directed his gaze toward his lap, where a cell phone was often concealed from other players' view, raising suspicions of receiving information about opponent's hole cards. Alternatively, there were occasions when he wasn't focused on his lap during alleged cheating, prompting speculation that he might have been receiving electronic signals through the brim of his hat. It's so easy when you can see the cards. Yeah. So easy. Preceding his suspicious winning streak, Postle typically kept his cell phone open on the poker table's railing, in line of sight with opponents, a practice that changed during the contentious period. His poker results during this time frame fluctuated between winning and losing, deviating from the earlier perception of him as an unstoppable poker force. As the investigation progressed, the fallout was swift and it was severe. Stone's gambling hall faced immense scrutiny and Postle's reputation crumbled under the weight of the allegations. Lawsuits were filed and the poker community engaged in heated debates about the implications for the integrity of the game. The fallout extended beyond the poker table, casting a shadow over the entire gambling industry and prompting a reevaluation of security measures in live stream games. On the 9th of October 2019, a group of players initiated a class action lawsuit seeking $30 million in damages against both Postle and Stone's Gambling Hall. By June 2020, a federal judge dismissed the lawsuit, citing some archaic California law. The case against Postle was dismissed with prejudice, barring any subsequent filings against him. Saying unfortunately, a lot of idiots make up stories and want to contribute to the drama and conspiracy theories. Both claims are 100% false, and we'll be providing that as soon as possible. Within three months of the dismissal, however, many agreed to settle. However, some were adamant against settling, including Veronica Brill. Years of legal back and forth ensued until January 7, 2022, when a confidential agreement was entered into Postle's bankruptcy records, marking the closure of the only remaining litigation arising from the Stones Gambling Hall live stream poker cheating scandal. This development effectively brought an end to the official Postlegate saga. 
In the aftermath of the scandal, Mike Postle retreated from the public eye. Very little was heard from him until a strange occurrence in early 2023 when he made a surprising appearance at the Beau Rivage Hotel and Casino in Biloxi, Mississippi, participating in the Million Dollar Heater main event. He ended up making the final table, coming in seventh place and earning over $32,000 in the $1,200 event. To try and hide his identity, Postle wore a hoodie and a face mask and chose to enter the competition under an alias, adopting the name Mike Lawrence, which happens to be his middle name as indicated in court documents. The circumstances surrounding Mike Lawrence's exit from the final suggested that the poker community had not yet forgiven him for his actions. In a crucial hand, Postle went all in with pocket tens on a flop with just a six high. His opponent, Brock Gary, held trips with a pair of sixes, making it an apparent straightforward decision for Gary to call with such a strong hand. Rather than quickly make the call, however, Gary chose to deliberate, pretending to be indecisive and leading Postle to believe there was a possibility he was in a favorable position. Even though this was an obvious slow roll, one of the cardinal sins of poker, in this instance, everyone seemed to be completely okay with it. The tale of Mike Postle is one that spans from the heights of poker winnings to the depths of scandal and of controversy. His journeys prompted the entire poker community to reflect on the delicate balance between trust and skepticism, in not only the world of poker, but in the world of gambling as a whole. And in a medium where trust is paramount, yet very seldomly given or received, who knows how long this massive betrayal will take to heal. You know, you've let me do this to you several times now. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like this hand. This hand right here turned the poker world on its head. And yes, it's been discussed to death. I really went all through all that trouble to cheat, to win that money, why the hell would I give it back? Yes, I used that thumbnail as clickbait. But what was the fallout? And why did it send shockwaves across the poker world? This is a pure bluff catcher. Uh, With Jack High? The infamous hand went down during one of the Hustler Casino live streams. Garrett Edelstein was dealt an 8-7 suited and raised the pot to $3,000. Robbie Jade Lou with a meager Jack 4 offsuit called the $2,200 raise to her, and the two were heads up going into the flop. Wow, Robbie really mixing it up here, calling Garrett's raise with Jack 4 off. It's wine versus wine. And the flop looked amazing for Garrett with a 10 10 9 and two clubs, giving him an open ended straight flush draw. It did nothing for Robbie, however, who still sat with a Jack high. Garrett quickly bet $2,500 to which Robbie Snap called. The turn was a nothing burger, a three of hearts showing up helping no one. And this is usually when Garrett will lay the hammer down with combo draws. Garrett didn't back down and bet a strong $10,000. And astoundingly, Robbie Min raised to 20,000. What is she thinking about here? Is she 20. gonna raise it? After thinking about it for a while, Garrett eventually went all in. Yup, there's the all in. A raise of $129,000. At this point, in no world should Robbie have called with her jack high. Yet still, she paused. She thought about it. You want me to call you? She tried to get a read on Garrett and remarkably made the call. She told the table it was a pure bluff catcher. With Jack High? Even though that still made no sense given that she had a Jack High. The two agreed to run the hand twice. What is going on here? once, but it's up to you. The first time the river ended up being a nine of diamonds, which unfortunately didn't help Garrett with a straight or a flush. It gave Robbie the win with her Jack High. The second time it was an ace of spades, again, not helping Garrett and giving Robbie the win. When Robbie finally flipped her cards over, revealing her jack four, the table was stunned. Four jack high? What? Whoa! <laughs> Look at you. Whoa! Oh, yeah. With Garrett looking visibly shocked and shaken. This was not a hand that would be forgotten. This would be a hand that would be examined and re-examined until the truth came out. You look like you want to kill me, Garrett. Oh, he wants to vomit. <laughs> but let's take a step back. Garrett Edelstein was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, emerging from a childhood marked by curiosity and an insatiable appetite for challenge. Growing up in a middle-class family, he developed a keen interest in poker early on, and he would later showcase this at the poker table. His journey into the poker world began during his college years. Drawn to the intellectual and psychological aspects of the game, he quickly rose through the ranks, earning recognition for his unconventional yet effective playing style. As his skills sharpened, Edelstein would go on to significant victories on the poker circuit. Some of his biggest victories included 
included a $48,000 win from the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure in 2008, a $48,000 win from the 2010 WSOP main event, the River Cards a club, and Johnny Chan knocks out Adelstein, and a $49,000 win from the 2016 WSOP main event. From high stakes cash games to prestigious tournaments, Edelstein demonstrated a mastery of the poker arts. His ability to read opponents combined with fearless decision making led to memorable wins and established him as a force to be reckoned with in the poker world. And we can't forget he was a player and survivor Brains vs. Brawn vs. Beauty, where he was on the Brains tribe. Unfortunately, his strategic mind did not do much to help him as he was voted out second. Second person voted out of Survivor Kageyan. Garrett. Not much is known about Robbie Jade Lou's background. She currently resides in the Pacific Palisades and her early exposure to poker was through casual games with friends. With Hendon Mob Cashes dating back to 2010, Lou says she started taking poker more seriously after the coronavirus pandemic. She previously worked for the pharmaceutical company Bayer before transitioning to poker full time. How do you make someone give the money back? I don't understand. I don't know. He took it. She him. He, he talked, somehow talked her into giving the money. Following an exhaustive three-month inquiry into the hand, the allegations of foul play against Robbie Jade Lou were dismissed. The investigation conducted by High Stakes Poker Productions revealed no credible evidence of wrongdoing, although it emphasized that the absence of proof does not necessarily indicate the absence of misconduct. You called all in on the turn because... Yeah, because uh, you don't have... That's right. She you thinks you can't shit. be a jack high. High Stakes Poker Productions, the owner of Hustler Casino Live, had launched an investigation investing over $100,000 in cybersecurity, private investigation, and legal expertise. The investigative report outlined the methodology, including interviews with involved parties and extensive video analysis. Despite finding no evidence of tampering with the card shuffler, cybersecurity experts identified critical risks in the production room setup, allowing for potential cheating. Consequently, security measures were enhanced with a locked door and restricted access to the whole card information. Acknowledging that absolute prevention of cheating is challenging, the report emphasized ongoing vigilance. Low-tech modifications were implemented, such as requiring players to sign waivers against financial ties within the game. The investigation disclosed an unresolved incident where production employee allegedly removed $15,000 in chips from Lou's stack after filming ended. The employee faces charges of grand theft with an arrest warrant issued. High Stakes Poker Productions revealed his financial desperation as the motive and expressed regret for not conducting a background check before hiring him. The company pledged future diligence in vetting employees. Garrett Edelstein expressed satisfaction with the show's improved safety measures. Despite the events, the poker community reactions varied, with some seeing it as a positive force that brought increased scrutiny and security to poker live streams. It also should be noted that Robbie did decide to give back the money she won in the hand, even though she passed a polygraph test with flying colors. In the aftermath of the controversy, Edelstein chose to step away from poker for a period of introspection. The hiatus marked by self-reflection and recalibration allowed him to recharge and refocus. His return to the poker scene is now poised to be a monumental comeback, with fans eagerly awaiting his re-entry into the competitive arena. In a tweet he said, after not watching or playing a hand, for over a year recently, my mindset has shifted. I miss the competition. I miss the strategy. I miss taking souls. I miss gambling, killing the dealer one time versus my nitty pro opponents. I miss poker and I'm ready to battle. DMs are open. As of today, both Garrett Edelstein and Robbie Liu have navigated through the highs and the lows of professional poker. Edelstein's comeback was met with anticipation while Liu continues to assert her presence in the poker landscape. The controversy that wants to find their interaction now serves as a footnote in the broader narrative of their respective careers. But one thing is certain, for better or worse, Jack 4 offsuit from now on will always be known as the Robbie. And it's a hand that Edelstein will likely always be quick to fold, as everyone should. If, when, where, and to what extent variance, uh, the role variance has had on that person's results is, is just an insurmountable task. Tom Dewan, Daniel Jungleman Cates, Phil Ivey. It's always thrilling to watch a true poker prodigy in their prime. And in the case of Jose Jira Macedo, 
everyone believed there was another poker phenom in the making. But the whole thing turned out to be a tale of smoke and mirrors, of deception, and ultimately, a massive con. But how did this one scam artist turn the entire online poker world upside down? Oh, my worst month in poker was about negative 500k, but only 200k or so of that was from poker and the rest was from being scammed. In the world of poker where fortunes are made and lost in the blink of an eye, tales of triumph and of scandal often intertwine. Born and raised in Lisbon, Portugal, Jose Macedo's early life was far from the thought of the world of professional poker. Not much is known about his early beginnings, but Macedo's entry into the poker world was a serendipitous affair. Introduced to the game by friends during his late teens, he quickly discovered a natural aptitude for the strategic nuances of poker. Fueled by a competitive drive, Macedo dove headfirst into the world of online poker. The virtual felt became Macedo's arena, and he wasted no time in making a name for himself before he was even 18 years old. With an uncanny ability to read opponents and a fearless approach to risk, he began accumulating victories that reverberated throughout the poker community, showing off millions in winnings. Macedo's unbelievable rise was punctuated by impressive performances in online tournaments, earning him the respect and admiration of his peers. However, in the world of poker, success is often accompanied by scrutiny. And in a shocking turn of events, news broke of a scandal involving Macedo and another player known as Sauron 1989. The scandal which unfolded in 2011 centered around an alleged scam to cheat opponents out of significant sums of money. But let's back up a bit to see how we got here. Just really arrogant. I was really arrogant at that time. I really thought I was playing like 100 NL, but I really thought I was the king of the world already and I thought I was going to be the best in the world. In late 2010, a buzz enveloped the poker world when a thread surfaced on the widely followed 2 plus 2 poker forum. This thread centered around a young prodigy from Portugal, claiming to dominate the high-stakes games. Despite being allegedly underage, this newcomer was reportedly thriving in some of the largest online poker arenas. And this marked the genesis of the Jose Gira Macedo saga. The poker community pondered over the identity of this rising star, and they questioned whether he truly matched the hype. However, what seemed to be the start of a promising poker narrative took an unexpected turn. Rumors swirled for months with little concrete information about the Portuguese poker prodigy. Then in early 2011, Jira himself created a revealing thread on the 2 plus 2 forum, shedding light on his background and on his poker journey. I started off playing 1-2 cents where I grinded as many tables as possible basically and just bonused a lot and used a lot of bonuses. Impressively showcasing his results, the young player detailed his ascent from low stakes tables, leaving an indelible impression on the community. However, a closer examination raised suspicions. Metaphors, a mandatory sob story, and other nuances hinted that Macedo's narrative might not be as genuine as it seemed. Despite endorsements from well-known pros like Jungle Man and Dog His Head, skepticism arose. Some believe Jira to be a creation of these pros, utilizing Jungle Man's stats in the post. Ultimately, Jira ended up securing a contract with Lock Poker and joined forces with Poker Strategy, a prominent poker training site. At one point, he was even challenging Tom Dewan to play in a round of the Dirt Challenge, the gold standard of heads-up poker. I put up 1.5 million on the side to anyone's 500,000. And if you're up a dollar, you keep that. And if you're up a million, you keep the million plus the side bet. If you want to learn more about the Dirt Challenge, we've got a great video all on that and on Tom Dewan. Check it out. The link is in the description. But back to Macedo, the controversy surrounding him escalated in August 2011. Now, details of the scandal were murky at first, but involved accusations of multi-accounting, ghosting, and other unethical practices. Macedo, who had previously been celebrated for his skill and strategic prowess, now found himself embroiled in a controversy that threatened to tarnish his reputation irreparably. Macedo allegedly orchestrated matches where players' whole cards were exposed through Skype, providing an unfair advantage to his accomplices. A 2 plus 2 forum user, going by the alias Moss Boss, initiated a discussion exposing a heads-up strategy Skype group that was initiated by Macedo. Macedo, masquerading as a poker coach, offered to spectate and guide players during live poker sessions conducted remotely on Skype. Around July 2011, Macedo began promoting matches against a player named Sauron 1989 on iPoker, depicting them as an easily exploitable opponent to the members of the strategy group, just a giant fish. 
showing her that Chris Ferguson is uh, like a Harvard professor and how it's a respected way of his mathematical and stuff, showing her like Nananoko's graph to show that like it's possible to be a very consistent winner. Group members engaged in high stakes games against Saran 1989 on iPoker. Despite Macedo's assurances of Saran 1989 being a weak player, participants consistently incurred substantial losses, some even reaching five figure amounts in a single session. One such unfortunate player was Moss Boss, who experienced a staggering loss across two sessions while Macedo observed on Skype. Growing suspicious during the matches against Sara in 1989, Moss Boss scrutinized the Skype chat logs with Macedo that occurred concurrently with the games. Upon closer examination, Moss Boss discovered a correlation between Sara in 1989 disconnecting from iPoker and Macedo logging off of Skype simultaneously. Facing mounting pressure from the strategy group members, Macedo eventually confessed to what they had suspected all along. He was the mastermind behind the Sara 1989 screen name, playing against them while remotely observing their whole cards via Skype. And as the scandal unraveled, consequences were swift and severe. Macedo faced public condemnation with many calling for his expulsion from the poker community. Online poker platforms took decisive action, banning Macedo from their sites. The fallout was not only financial, but also emotional, as trust among players was shattered, casting a shadow over the integrity of online poker. The fall had extended to Jungle Man and Daga's head as well, who faced backlash for vouching for Jira. Amidst community division, they promised to reimburse Macedo's victims, but distanced themselves from the scandal's responsibility. Macedo's swift rise and fall left the poker community in shock, prompting questions about the legitimacy of the original story. Despite attempts to understand the events, the true nature of the scandal remained obscured in mystery. Post-scandal, Macedo vanished from online poker, but did resurface in 2014, leading a cleaning service agency in the UK. This unexpected turn hinted at a redeemed path for Macedo, who seemed to have learned from his mistakes and sought success in a different field. The saga of Jose Jira Macedo is a complex narrative that encapsulates the highs and the lows of the poker world. Macedo's fall from grace sent shockwaves to the community, but at the end of the day, these stories are a dime a dozen in poker lore, proving that you can't really trust anyone in the sport. But isn't that kind of the point? Yeah, I don't think there's much talent to it. I mean, a lot of people say there is, but I, mean, I really think anyone, if they put their mind to it, they can be successful in poker. A poker star cheated out of over a million dollars. Cards that are see-through with special contact lenses. A friendship shattered by deceit. And to top it all off, a death threat. It's just another day in the high stakes world of poker. So let's talk about the recent tumultuous saga of Nick Airball, Wesley, and Mars. I four bet jam the flop hands and he calls me with one pair. I really need to work on my image. <laughs> so let's first get to know the players. Nick Airball is a well-known player in the high-stakes cash games on the popular Hustler Casino livestream. Renowned for his unpredictable and action-packed gameplay. Life is good! Oh, here we go. Whoa. I'll take it all. <laughs> That's not the pot. The heads up Let the fireworks <laughs> begin, Airball. He burst onto the scene on Hustler Casino Live on February 1st, 2022, winning almost $15,000 in one session. He would go on to win over $1 million on the stream up until a brutal session on St. Patrick's Day in 2023. There's a call! Oh my god. Airball just bet $110,000 and Rampage took about three seconds to make the call. When he lost over $750,000. Airball is down $670,000. Not much is known about his background. And there's been a lot of back and forth as to exactly where all of his money came from. Some have said that his money comes from his past life as an investment banker, but others say this simply isn't true. Wesley Fay, more commonly known as just Wesley, only began playing poker in 2022 when a friend introduced him to the game. He's largely recognized for his fearless approach to risking significant sums of money at the table. And he was apparently a millionaire crypto investor before getting his start in poker. You know, I have a hedge fund and my personally lost like 20 million dollar cash. Uh, you, you, know, you personally lost? Yeah, not, not including my fund. Yeah, my personally lost 20 million in cash. If you want to see something wild, you should watch this massive hand that he lost to Tom Dewan in the stream. One of the biggest hands in the history of televised or stream poker. There's the call! Is that call? 
Tom Dwan has just won the biggest pot in the history of televised poker. Now, Mars, his real name is Ye Shen, is a poker player hailing from Shanghai, China. He first came onto the scene in 2019 at the 50th World Series of Poker. He finished in 1,152nd place out of 8,659 players and earned $15,000. He has since gone on to win big, netting over $300,000 in profit from the Hustler Casino live stream alone. But now let's get to the scandal. While most of the poker world was at the WSOP paradise in the Bahamas, a riveting controversy between these men erupted. Nick Airball first took to social media to make startling allegations against Mars. Airball claimed that Mars cheated him out of $1 million through a series of poker games, leaving him deeply hurt and upset. In a tweet, he said, Just found out that someone who I thought was a close friend of mine cheated me out of $1 million in a series of poker games. Very hurt and upset for obvious reasons, more details soon. Wesley Fay joined Nick Airball in alleging cheating against Mars. Fay claimed that Mars brought his own deck and dealer to a home game, whose blinds range from 2550 to 5100. According to Fay, the deck used by Mars was see-through, allowing players to see the cards by wearing special contact lenses. Fay went on to say that he lost $1 million in the game, while Mars emerged with $1.6 million in winnings. Fay backed his claims with screenshots of text messages, with Mars confirming the use of Mark Dex. In response to these serious allegations, Mars denied cheating, but admitted to bring the Mark Deck to the poker game. According to Wesley, Mars justified his actions by suggesting that the accusers might be attempting to avoid payment by changing the deck. Despite this denial, Faye emphasized the special deck used by Mars was not standard and could not be purchased at a regular store. Despite Mars maintaining a Twitter silence since the allegations surfaced, the situation remained tense. It's crucial to note that the Hustler Casino livestream itself is not implicated in any wrongdoing, as the allegations solely revolve around the actions of the poker players featured on the stream at a non-Hustler Casino live event. Later, in a statement to Poker News, Mars said, I'm writing this statement statement to set the record straight on some false accusations that have personally damaged my reputation. I have won and lost huge amounts numerous times in my poker career, but I have never cheated in a game, and I have always paid when I lost. Mars would go on to target Faye's poker struggles, saying his now former friend is on a major downswing in poker after having lost 1.5 million in a private game heads up poker battle and a couple hundred thousand in Vegas and millions more. However, during the Las Vegas Grand Prix last month, Faye gave Poker News a tour of his $400,000 Caesars Palace suite. But Mars says he constantly posts pictures of himself on social media with super luxury cars, mansions, and suites at Caesars Palace. None of these assets are his. They all belong to our mutual friend, and Wesley lies to everyone to portray a certain image. Mars goes into more detail, revealing a lot more about what he says he went on. He writes, October 14th, Zio called me to co-host a game with him at his apartment. I told Zio we will both bring players to the game. When we spoke about this, he asked if I wanted to bring the dealer. I responded to him, I can bring cards from your Belinda. You can call your dealers. After a couple hours passed, Zio and myself agreed to change the game location to Yorba Linda. So since we are playing at Yorba, there was no need for me to bring cards because they have multiple decks there at the game. When I arrived at the game, there were 67 people already sitting at the table. So there's no way that I could have switched or brought cards since everyone was there. After the game, we found out the cards were marked. At that time, I found Zio brought the deck, but he arrived around the same time I did. So that changed my mind about accusing Zio. Three weeks later, one of the players who went back to China confessed to me on the phone and said he was sorry for all of the players blaming me. He went on to tell me he switched the cards because he was losing so much recently. His name is Sun. After I received this information, I went directly to the owner of the house and explained everything. Two other people other than me can confirm this. I feel bad that I did not arrive earlier to the game, so there would have been a chance that I could have prevented the situation from even happening. I would like to apologize to the following players who were at the game. Pink, Brick, Chris, Zio, Jason, and Joey. Airball and Wesley were both clearly missing in the apology. Things would go even further when a phone call was released between Wesley and Mars, and potential violence was threatened. 
Mars said, I'm calling you right now to discuss something. It's not important whether I win or lose, and I want to explain the situation to you. I've already talked to the boss about this. I don't want any more overly aggressive actions. I can't control the boss anymore. He would then go on to say, because if it continues like this, there will be bloodshed. I don't want this matter to escalate to that level. He also apparently did not care if the call was recorded. Wesley asked, but what about the money owed? The con team also made money, right? To which Mars responded, it's no longer about the money for them now. The money they earned here is not their big money. And finally, anyway, I think you shouldn't push them too hard. If pushed too hard, a cornered dog will jump over a wall, and it's really not a good thing. Needless to say, the controversy surrounding Nick Airball, Wesley, and Mars sent shockwaves through the poker community, raising questions about integrity and fair play in the high-stakes poker circuit. The controversy serves as another reminder of the challenges and controversies that can arise in a world where millions of dollars are at stake at all times, and the line between fair play and deception is often razor thin. But for most poker players, they wouldn't have it any other way. Did she really rig a poker giveaway to give the prize to her boyfriend? Could anyone actually have thought this was a good idea and that they could get away with it? Crazier things have happened in the world of poker, but this one is definitely up there. So let's first talk a little bit about the woman behind it all. Q Zhou, widely known by her online alias Nemo, was born in China on January 6, 2000. I'm ethnically Chinese. I'm born in China. Um, I grew up there until I was age three. China is and was a country known for its rich cultural heritage and strong emphasis on education. Growing up, Zhou exhibited a keen intellect and a natural inclination towards strategic thinking. From an early age, she demonstrated exceptional cognitive abilities, which soon drew her toward the world of chess. Zhou's upbringing was marked by an environment that encouraged intellectual pursuits and disciplined practice. Her parents recognized her potential and provided her with the necessary support and resources to nurture her talent. And under their guidance, Zhou embarked on her journey in the world of chess, where she would soon make her mark as a formidable competitor. Zhou's entry into the world of chess was a turning point in her life. She quickly rose through the ranks, showcasing a remarkable understanding of the game's nuances and strategies. Her dedication to mastering the game was evident, as she spent countless hours honing her skills and studying the moves of renowned chess masters. You're a grandmaster then. Yeah. Wait, are you the strongest player in Singapore? Uh, by everything, yes. By, oh my gosh. I, I did not know that. As she continued to excel in chess tournaments, Zhou gained recognition both nationally and internationally. She'd become an under-14 girls world youth champion, a Canadian women's national champion, and a Finnish women's national champion. However, despite her success in chess, Zhou's insatiable thirst for new challenges led her to explore other avenues, where she could apply her strategic instincts. She started a Twitch channel in 2020, streaming chess and other games. She was able to amass a substantial following, over 100,000 followers in less than a year. And then later that same year, she signed with CounterLogic Gaming, effectively becoming the first chess player ever to sign with an esports organization. And all of this then takes us to the poker phase of her career. The transition from chess to poker marked a new chapter in Zhou's journey. Intrigued by the complexities of the game and drawn to its dynamic nature, she cracked the aces. Wow. And now she must be chip leader. She has okay, three three million. Jo saw poker as an exciting new opportunity. With characteristic determination, she immersed herself in the world of poker, eager to conquer yet another domain. Zhou's transition to poker was not without its challenges, though. Unlike chess, where the rules are fixed and outcomes are determined solely by skill, poker required a different set of abilities, psychological insight, emotional control. However, Zhou's adaptability served her well as she navigated the intricacies of the game. In the realm of poker, Zhou's rise to prominence was quick, but a 2022 controversy put a mark on her stellar reputation. So what happened? Well, after securing a coveted seat in the WPT World Championship, an event seat valued at a hefty $12,000 and hosted on the WPT global platform, she opted to hold a contest to give away the prize seat. But the contest took a U-turn when allegations of unfairness emerged. The uproar began when Joe, during a live stream of her gameplay, clinched the $12,000 package after staging an impressive comeback from a significant heads-up deficit. She then outlined the contest details on Twitter 
Twitter, requiring participants to watch her video and be among the first 10 to comment with a specific code phrase hidden within the content. Now things got worse when Zhou announced that her poker coach and boyfriend, Alex Thalo Epstein, won the contest. We're gonna take a quick break from this video to talk about a poker platform I've really been enjoying lately, and that's Replay Poker. As you may have guessed, I'm a pretty avid poker player, so finding the right poker platform has always been important to me. And that's why I love Replay Poker. Replay Poker is free, it requires no downloads, so it's super easy to get in and start playing poker right away. Something I truly love about Replay Poker is the people. It's got one of the best online communities around, full of poker enthusiasts just like like me, and I'm guessing you since you took the time to watch this video. And right now is an exciting time to be on the platform as their big winter showdown campaign will be live on the site until March 3rd and will include a lot of different promotions and competitions for you to participate in. So sign up to Replay Poker today using my link and join an amazing poker community with fun competitions and exciting promotions. And now, back to the video. While Thala was indeed among the first 10 commenters, skepticism shrank the legitimacy of the competition, given his obviously close relationship with Joe. Notable figures in the poker community, including Sean Deeb, voiced concerns about the integrity of the giveaway. Some suggested that the seat should be revoked and redistributed through a more transparent process. In response to the backlash, Joe expressed regret over the handling of the contest, acknowledging the misstep in allowing Thalo to participate in the first place. She apologized for the oversight and pledged to conduct future giveaways with greater transparency. And meanwhile, Thalo defended himself on social media, explaining that he edited his comment post-submission to include the code phrase, a move that raised even further suspicion among critics. Despite detailed explanations from both parties, doubts continued to linger within the poker community regarding the fairness of the contest, causing Thalo to eventually give back the seat. In the end, Zhou decided to do a revised drawing, adhering to the original rules that she had established for the giveaway of the World Poker Tour seat package, and this time she excluded Thalo from eligibility. The new recipient, identified as EC Gab on Twitter, emerged as the new winner of the WPT seat. Zhou would then go on to issue an apology for the handling of the giveaway's initial iteration, expressing regret and acknowledging her mishandling of the situation. She said, Apparently this needs to be addressed, so I'm only going to comment on it once and move on. As Twitter is already far too draining on my mental health to give all of this toxicity any more energy. I see a lot of you talking about my choice to give something I won to someone I know and who's helped me rather than you, your friend or the best written sob story. Yes, I chose to give the package to the person I felt was most deserving. I never would have won the package without Thalo in the first place. He's helped me on every step of my poker journey, not to mention coached me that entire tournament as well. And he met the qualifications for the giveaway. Apparently that means it was rigged or a scam to some of you. I don't feel that way. And frankly, I'm not going to feel bad about giving it to the person I think deserves it most. My community aren't poker players, and I didn't have time to organize some elaborate giveaway. I work 15-hour days as it is. If anyone who's upset about this thinks deserves should be based on on someone's net worth, age, or whatever other personal reasons, then feel free to do your own giveaways with your own money on your own time. I won't be addressing this again. Now obviously this statement added more controversy as it made it clear that her original intention was to simply award the seat to Thalo without a public giveaway. Thalo in turn confessed to manipulating the contest requirements by editing his entry to include the necessary code phrase hidden within Joe's video posts. Joe would eventually go on to delete this post as well. And while this reversal and the selection of a random replacement may mitigate legal consequences, both Joe and Epstein's reputations may take time to recover from this ordeal. At the end of the day, maybe Zhou should stick to chess, or maybe she should just stay away from giveaways. Let's be real. There aren't too many poker stars that are more despised than guys like Howard Lederer or Chris Ferguson. One man almost took the crown. His name? Jake Schindler. Do you want me to answer for you? I'm just, he's gonna go get he's gonna go get a drink and go count his money. All right. Jake Schindler's name once resonated strongly through the halls of the poker world, evoking images of strategic brilliance, considerable skill, and unimaginable dominance. Our super high roller bowl Europe champion, he wins $3.2 million. His story began on September 25th, 1989 in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. This is where his fascination with games of strategy first took root. But it was during his college years that Schindler stumbled upon the game of poker. 
initially as a recreational pursuit among friends. Little did he know that this casual pastime would soon transform into a lifelong passion, a path to prominence, and eventually a very unenviable position. Jake and Ali Ismirovic both turned away from registration, according to Dietrich Fast over in Monaco. Driven by an insatiable thirst for knowledge and improvement, Schindler immersed himself in the intricacies of the game. He devoured books, dissected hands, and honed his skills with relentless determination. His natural aptitude for understanding the nuances of poker swiftly propelled him from the kitchen table to the high stakes arenas of the professional circuit. With each hand dealt and each pot won, Schindler's reputation as a formidable adversary grew. His adeptness at reading opponents, coupled with a disciplined approach to risk management, distinguished him as one of the premier players in the game. And from the glittering tables of Vegas to the prestigious tournaments of the global stage, Schindler's presence became synonymous with excellence and with achievement. He first started playing in live tournaments all the way back in 2009. On Poker Stars, he played under the moniker Call It A Rush and showcased his skills in the online arena. In a triumphant moment in September of 2013, he clinched victory at the World Championship of Online Poker, amassing an impressive sum of close to $150,000. But this was just the beginning. He made his mark at the World Series of Poker in 2011, where he cashed at the $5,000 No Limit Hold'em six-handed and the $1,000 No Limit Hold'em events. Fast forward then to August of 2018, Schindler sees the spotlight by clinching the SHRPO High Roller title, pocketing a substantial $800,758 prize after outmaneuvering Sean Deeb in a heads up battle. Why do you think you were able to beat him heads up in the end? I mean, I flopped trips like three times. Yeah, I got good cards, made mostly right decisions. And it worked out. Later that same year, Schindler emerged victorious at the WPT Five Diamond 100K event, securing a grand prize of $1,332,000. With an astonishing 31 final tables in 2018 alone, surpassing the likes of Stephen Chidwick, who managed 26, Schindler cemented his dominance and ultimately claimed the coveted Card Player of the Year award. By 2018, Schindler's winnings from live poker tournaments soared above $23 million, solidifying his status as the all-time money leader in Pennsylvania. However, amidst the euphoria of success lurked the shadows of controversy. It seems as though they're making a very clear statement by saying, like, the most egregious actors are absolutely not going to make more money in this game if, if we have anything to do about it or say about it. Schindler's journey was not devoid of turbulence, and his path to greatness was marred by moments of turmoil. Allegations of cheating and involvement in high-profile scandals cast a pail over his illustrious career, tarnishing the once gleaming facade of his achievements. Now, not much about the controversy is public, but in 2022, allegations of collusion during live tournaments and the utilization of real-time assistance, or RTA, software online were leveled against Schindler and other poker pros by several top-tier professionals. So if they ban Jake, it's literally on the precedence that they know that he RTAs in, in multi-account. Poker Go took decisive action by suspending Schindler and others, marking the company's firmest stance against such behavior to date. Schindler would find himself barred from participating in all Poker Go events throughout the 2022 season as announced in a statement issued by the Poker Titan. The statement reads, The Poker Go Tour today announced the indefinite suspensions of Ali Imsarovic and Jake Schindler from Tour Play, effective immediately. The suspensions will extend through at least the 2022 PGT season, upon which time a review will take place. The PGT is committed to upholding the highest standards of integrity and emphasizes proper conduct to ensure the safety and security of its players and events. Both players have been ruled ineligible for the season-ending PGT Championship and have been removed from the 2022 PGT leaderboard. This suspension effectively sidelined Schindler from participation in the ongoing Poker Masters High Roller Series at the Poker Go Studio and also made him ineligible for the inclusion in the 2022 PGT leaderboard. But despite all of this, shortly after, Jake Schindler still went to the World Series of Poker and played his regular schedule. Many were annoyed that he was there amidst the allegations, but he eventually claimed victory at the 2022 WSOP $50,000 buy-in No Limit Hold'em event, seizing a bracelet and a substantial prize of over $1,328,000. We even stay alive on the turn. He will not. 11 years in the making, Jake Schindler has his first bracelet. 
This triumph marked Schindler's fourth title of the year, which also included a remarkable $3.2 million win as the Super High Roller Bowl Europe champion. Not today, taking home the title, the ring, $3.2 million. Give it up for Jake Schindler. Just a master class. Throughout 2022, he demonstrated remarkable consistency, reaching 10 final tables and amassing over $7 million in earnings. Following this bracelet win at the WSOP, Schindler posed for photographs, but to no surprise, opted not to entertain inquiries from the media. The spotlight of scrutiny illuminated Schindler's actions, revealing a complex narrative fraught with moral ambiguity and ethical dilemmas. Ultimately, what we want is to create a penalty so, so great that people stop taking the risk to cheat, right? Mm. And hitting them where it hurts is really hitting them at scale. Despite his undeniable talent and unwavering dedication, his legacy became entwined with the darker facets of the poker world and the perils that accompany the pursuit of glory at any cost. The saga of Jake Schindler embodies many lessons that are each imbued with the wisdom gleaned from experience. His rise was swift and it was decisive, yet his reputational downfall is a reminder of the pitfalls that accompany the allure of fame and fortune and caution against the productive allure of expediency at the expense of integrity. But hey, when you're 34 years old and you're one of the highest earning poker players in history, does a single controversy cloud the rest of your achievements? And will Jake Schindler's ultimate legacy be one of triumph or of defeat? And that one might be up to the public to decide. You know, the, the thing that saddens me is, is once again, you know, you know, the hero of the story was also cheating. Um, and that's just not, the heroes of poker don't cheat.